Hello and welcome from the First United Methodist Church in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, where over my shoulder you'll be able to see a new door. It's one that wasn't there even a week ago, but one that needed to be put into the side of the church building because we've begun working with Mom's House, a wonderful nonprofit that provides free daycare for single parents who are working to complete their education. And that means that there are going to be babies who are in the nursery during the week, and there has to be a special door just for them in case of emergencies, which is why there's no handle on the outside. It's only an emergency exit. And there are still a few details that need to be done to finish it off, although the rest of the center is licensed and in, in operation, and it is wonderful, wonderful to hear the sound of kids uh, in, the, in the hallways and in the classrooms and out on the playground. Uh, from where I stand, you can't see it. There is more sidewalk chalk on the basketball court than um, I've seen in quite a while. And it's terrific that it's there. The church as people, as well as a church building, are people who continue to grow and to change to learn new things, to recognize new gifts from the Spirit, and new ministries, new opportunities to serve, just like the building. I hope you are doing that yourself. And if there's anything we can do to help that along, let us know. But one of the big things that we continue to do and that we find sustains us and stretches us, challenges us, and keeps us on track is worship. And so we invite you to be part of that now. Let's worship together. Today we hear from the first letter of John, the third chapter, the first seven verses. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that the world did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and all who have this hope in him purify themselves as Christ is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous.
Part of today's reading has an unavoidable kind of resonance for me. I don't expect other people will have the same reaction to it that I do. Um, because, well, we're different people and our experiences are different. For me, one of the sections of that reading is a verse that appears at the beginning of the United Methodist uh, liturgy for a funeral or a memorial service. And after conducting a few hundred of those, um, there are certain things that echo in your head as soon as you hear them. Um, the service begins with, with a greeting Actually, it's more than a greeting. It's a proclamation. Dying, Christ destroyed our death. Rising, Christ restored our life. Christ will come again in glory. As in baptism, so and so, put on Christ. So in Christ may this person be clothed in glory. And then comes the verse, or a slightly different translation of it, but the words that come from 1 John chapter 3. Here and now, dear friends, we are God's children. What we shall be has not yet been revealed. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope purifies themselves as Christ is pure. And then the service continues from there with words of hope, with the reminders of the resurrection, with promises of God's comfort and promises of life that is more than the life that we have ever seen to this point. And in that verse with which things begin, there is a great deal of comfort. First off, that we are God's children. And as God's children, we grow. We grow more and more like the Lord, especially as his life was shared and his being dwelt among us in Jesus. And that being his children, we grow in his likeness to a degree that sets all of our experience into a broad perspective because it's the life of God that we're dealing with, not just our lives. And within that experience, there's a perspective that makes our 
biggest troubles and our biggest problems totally insignificant and at the same time makes some of our smallest moments of grace and our smallest flashes of miracle moments that are much larger than we could ever suspect transformative and wonderful and then there's that other comfort that comes through that verse hope of an even wider perspective yet but let's start with the first part here and now dear friends we are God's children In a book called The Spiritual Journey, Francis Nemec and Marie Theresa Coombs say, God's transforming and purifying embrace begins when I begin. At the moment of my individual creation, I become a child of God destined to eternal love. In that instant also, God starts drawing good from all my natural and mortal limitations. My interior life is coextensive with my human life. I am a child of God from the instant I become a child of my parents, a child of time, a child of my world. Let me again go back to the scripture here and now we are God's children all of us just as we are as an aside I don't know if uh, anybody watching this has ever seen a play called nonsense it's a great comedy and Nonsense is a great title, like uh, Tom Lehrer's uh, play, Tom Foolery. But this is Nonsense, and it deals with nuns. The characters are nuns teaching at a Catholic school, and they're trying to raise... Remember, this is a comedy, okay? They are trying to raise funds because one of their sisters, uh, who is a cook... Uh, was not careful in what she did, and several of their sisters in the convent have died of food poisoning, and they don't have the money to pay for the funerals for all of them all at once. And so um, they're trying to raise money to cover for this misdeed by, not, not a misdeed in the sense of murder, mis misdeed in the sense of negligence uh, by, by their sister their cook uh, whose name is of all things sister julia child of god all right you can stop laughing now but maybe it's not such a uh, an aside maybe it does go to the point because sister julia in her activity or failure to to do the things she was expected to do um, she felt short of expectations, to say the very least, with very, very serious consequences. Her cooking was lethal. But nevertheless, that didn't change the fact that she, even though she died of her own cooking, had a place among them and in a way still does. And in a serious way, in real life, just because we, all of us, fall into sin, whether it's by negligence or by intention, either way, that fact does not make us any less a child of God. It does affect our relationship 
with our loving parent. It does affect our relationship with one another. But we continue in relationship. However tangled that relationship may become. We are sinners, but we are sinners redeemed by God's grace. Luther tried to express that by, by saying that we are all at the same time sinners and justified. John Wesley tried to distinguish between sin, properly so-called, and mistakes or ignorance. First John puts it this way, everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Now that said, we know that when he came for us to take away sin, that took away and takes away our sin. And even though we abide in him, we sin. And yet, every time we move away from him, God comes after us. It, it's a whole process of, well, working together, of falling away and being called back. Forgiveness isn't once and done. It's a constant need. It's complicated. But we do grow in God's grace. What has been helpful to me as a person, and I hope it helps others, is to remember that everybody goes off in bad directions and becomes lost. But sin doesn't change. It may change where we are, but it doesn't change where we begin. If our starting point is that God created all things and called them good, and if God created human beings in his own image, and that includes us, then we are somehow anchored in our starting place, that we plant, grow where we are planted, and that we put down roots in God. And whatever may happen after that, we continue rooted and grounded in him, anchored in him. So that no matter whatever storms we face, whatever situations we get ourselves into, we're held by God's love. And it's God who reaches out all the time to offer us the help that we need, but find ourselves incapable of finding or sometimes even naming on our own. Beloved, we are God's children now. But the second half of that verse says, what we will has not yet been, what we will be has not yet been revealed. And I want to dwell on that part even more. And to point out that John is telling us that we don't know all that lies ahead of us. But we do know that it's worth looking forward to. 
that in and of itself is a promise worth holding on to. And it's part of being rooted in God. When God raised Jesus from the dead, Jesus was raised as a whole person, as a complete human being, but also as a changed person and a new kind of human being. After the resurrection, he was still fully human, but some of the limitations we deal with, the limitations that he dealt with, somehow no longer were holding him. Jesus, the book of Acts tells us, and, and some of Paul's letters say that he showed up suddenly in various places and various times and disappeared suddenly as well. Look at the end of the Gospel of John, and one minute he's there, and the next they don't see him. Sometimes when he appeared, his friends immediately recognized him, and sometimes they only knew it was him in retrospect. That's not the usual way of being human, but it was Jesus. What will we be like when God remakes all things? When God brings the world, not just the world, the universe to its completion, what will we be like? Who knows? But we'll be like Jesus in whatever way is most important. Don't let anybody tell you that they know exactly what is going to happen. They don't. The Bible says you don't know. We don't know. But we do know that he became like us so that we could be like him. And awareness of that kind of transformation that lies ahead is the source of Transformation of the life that we live now as well. There's a kind of awareness that comes with sharing our lives with him as well as him sharing our li his life with us that leads us into a kind of confidence that we may not know we have, but that shows up, like him, when it's most important. A very well-documented example comes to us in reports of the final days of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a German theologian and pastor who uh, left Germany in the 1930s for New York knowing what was going on and seeing how Hitler was trying to take over the German church and doing far too thorough a job of it. And at the last minute, the last boat from New York back to Germany before the war would break out, Bonhoeffer was on that. He went back and said, it was his place to be there among his people, to do what he could. And so he went. And he organized Christians who were ready and willing to stand up and do what was right, to be righteous. When so much of what was going on around them showed how Hitler was warping the church into his, his own twisted, warped image. Eventually, Bonhoeffer was arrested. Uh, he was 
suspected of involvement with an unsuccessful attempt to kill Hitler. Um, and probably they didn't have the proof at that point, but yeah, he was. He was involved in it. And he was sent to Buchenwald. Within a very short time, once he was arrested and imprisoned, he was doing all he could do to follow his calling, even in prison. He was held among a group of uh, special prisoners, people like uh, Molotov's nephew, uh, people like uh, a couple British spies or suspected spies, uh, people that uh, had high visibility, put it that way, um, if people would know their names, if put it that way, not that there was coverage of what was happening. But these special prisoners that he was part of, they formed a group that was shifted around and many of them were just simply killed off as the Allies closed in. On April 8th, 1945, which was the Sunday after Easter, they were being held in a schoolhouse where he was asked by the other prisoners that morning, including Molotov's atheist nephew, to lead them in worship. And so he did. He preached on 1 Peter 1, verse 3, which says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. One of the people who was present there later reported that he spoke, and I quote, in a manner which reached the hearts of all, finding just the right words to express the spirit of our imprisonment and the thoughts and resolutions which it had brought. Neither Bonhoeffer, nor the man who described that, nor anyone else present in that schoolroom prison, knew that as he was speaking to them, and as he was leading them in worship, that he was also being sentenced to execution. That less than 24 hours remained before he would be hanged. Payne Best, an English prisoner who was there that day, wrote, he had hardly finished his last prayer when the door opened and two evil-looking men in civilian clothes came in and said, prisoner Bonhoeffer, Get ready to come with us. Those words, come with us. For all prisoners, they had come to mean only one thing, the scaffold. We bade him goodbye. He drew me aside. This is the end, he said. For me, the beginning of life. Let me repeat again. Here and now, dear friends, we are God's children. What we shall be has not yet been revealed, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves as Christ is pure. Thanks to the resurrection of Jesus, our death, like his, is not the end. 
but the beginning, another beginning of life. Amen.